Hello, and thank you for joining me today with my guest, Kevin Lembo. He's the Comptroller for the State of Connecticut. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Kevin. It's always great to see you. Good. Now, Kevin, you, you have a career background that some people may not know about, and we want to talk about that a little bit before we get into the state of the state, as it were. Um, you have been the state's consecutive comptroller since 2011 Correct. until present, but prior to that 2010 election run, uh, you be became Connecticut's first health care advocate. Tell us a little bit about that. I know uh, there's a gentleman who, Mr. Doolittle, who has taken over that spot. That's I right. could interview him, but just yeah. give us a little bit of background how that's Yeah, started. Connecticut is somewhat unique in that it was one of the first in the nation to set up an independent health care advocate office. And the job really was about and continues to be about helping patients and their families mm -hmm. uh, and helping them uh, appeal mm -hmm. denials of um, uh, from Issues, the insurance company. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's a, uh, a pretty heady place to be. And mm -hmm. it's one of the few places in government where I felt every night as the healthcare advocate, I went home and locked the door out of the office and said, <laughs> yeah. I did something really important for yes. someone trying to get cancer care or right. trying to get some treatment that their insurance company had mm -hmm. just denied them. In a way, often that felt arbitrary. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's. I think it's a wonderful thing because people often feel as though they're fighting big companies and they don't know what to do and they don't. Well, perhaps they can't afford a lawyer or whatever the issue is. Or you're ill. So exactly. Right? Who has or the energy for that you're fight when you're trying to fight to a the disease? Point you can't right. Do anything. So yeah. that was a wonderful thing that you started. Now. Um, <clears throat> In this role, how how effective did you feel that you were able to do? Because those were the startup years. Did you mm -hmm. did you feel it? Was it a feel your way along, or did you have a plan and an objective for it? How, yeah. how much planning went into it? So the objectives were you clear. You had lawyers. On, we on did, the staff. yeah. So the objectives were clear because they were uh, embedded in statute, mm. right? So the law said what we were supposed uh -huh. to do. But when I got there, I was you know one of two employees. Mm -hmm. You know, so we really had to figure out how to stand this office up and mm -hmm. make it operate and mm -hmm. make it a useful resource for. people. Mm -hmm. People, and most importantly, figure out how to let people know that it was there. Yes. So they could call when Publicizing they needed help. Publicizing it. Sure, right. sure. Um, and I would say in a very short period of time, I was there mm -hmm. for six years, mm -hmm. uh, we went from doing, you know, 14,000 cases one year to, wow. you know, 10 times that amount in some years and turning millions and millions of dollars back to patients and their families, yeah. the value of the claim that had been denied. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you looked at the return on investment for that office, yeah. um, the insurance uh, companies through mm -hmm. the insurance fund were actually paying for it. Mm -hmm. So they were paying for me to fight with them yes. to pay the claims True. for the patient. So it uh, it's yeah. uh, an exquisite uh, yeah. uh, design as yeah. well. All right, very successful. And in addition, you also maintained a part-time appointed position with uh, as a clinical instructor at the Yale School of Training. So, yeah, yeah. And so I live in Guilford, and okay. uh, I have uh, quite a bit of interaction with Yale, both on the School of Public Health side and the mm -hmm. Yale uh, Law School, mm -hmm. as well as the School of Nursing. And so we'll sometimes have students that are here, nursing students and others. Uh, we have a really smart intern who's with us right mm -hmm. now, and mm -hmm. in that proctor proctoring uh, relationship, uh, you you get that appointment uh, to the faculty. Your, your life is really serving the public. Is that is that something that was instigated from a family thing, or this was just uh, in your DNA to want yeah, to serve? That's interesting. Um, I, I grew up in a community, and many of us did, um, that was very closely knit, mm -hmm. and uh, people leaned on each other uh, okay. when they needed to. and. I never felt uh, comfortable Yes. as I watched friends and colleagues go off to business school or go mm. to work on Wall Street. It never felt comfortable to me, mm. um, but I was a data nerd and continue to be one. <laughs> yeah. uh, so using data yeah. uh, to help government make good decisions uh -huh. and advocate for good public health policy, health care yes. policy, education yes. policy um, is an important place uh, yes. for people who are built that way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, no one, no five-year-old wakes up and says, hey, I want to be comptroller when I no, grow up, no, right? No. This is sort of a place where people find no. themselves after uh, working in these areas for a long time. And it, so, is, it, is, it is a pathway, and you often kind of, where you started is not where you end up, but it had right. its reasons for why it went there. I'll often tell young people when I'm at a high school or at a college, they'll say, okay, so what was your area of concentration yes, when yes. you were in college? So you got to be comptroller. Right. And I stop them every time and yeah. say, you know, first do what you love. Right. Right. Figure out, is it nursing? Is it education? Yes. Is it public health? What is it? And the business, mm. whatever it is, do mm. it, do it well. Mm. And then bring that experience to the larger public conversation about important issues that face our state. Right. It makes for a better legislator, mm. a better comptroller, and I would mm. argue a better governor. Mm. Yeah. Well, we hope that Connecticut is on a better a better turn. Uh, this, yeah. I mean, people have a lot of, I think, hope 
is um, th that if you can keep that carrot in front of you, that's what makes people continue on. And we're going to cover some of those things. Um, you, you developed also a long-term health care program in northeastern New York, mm -hmm. and uh, you were a program director for AIDS education. That's what I'm saying. Your service, uh, public service, is just a phenomenal record. It well, really thank is. you. I appreciate that. Well, all right. So <clears throat> as your current position as comptroller, you're sometimes referred to as the state's financial guardian mm -hmm. uh, and, and watchdog. But I think what we need is a little defining here because people hear treasurer and they hear accountancy and finance and comptroller. So give us a sense of what comptroller, what those responsibilities sure. are and how far your authority goes. I'm, I'm happy to. So mm. uh, the comptroller in Connecticut is one of six constitutional officers, meaning we're mentioned in the Constitution. And those are often the obvious ones, like mm -hmm. the governor and the lieutenant governor mm -hmm. the attorney general. Mm -hmm. But we also have the secretary of state, okay. the treasurer, and the comptroller. Okay. Uh, so I'm number five right. uh, in that list of six, and that's not the order. Uh, uh, not the order of priority. That's right. Or that we ascend to the <laughs> right. to the right, governorship right. should something yes, happen yes, to the yes, five four people ahead of me. Succession paper. <laughs> uh, but rather our order in which we appear in the constitution, because okay. we all didn't come into the constitution sure. at once. Sure. Uh, so the comptroller in Connecticut, and it's unique from state to state, is charged with a number of important functions. I run the core financial system, which is the blinking financial heart of the state, where personnel uh, transactions occur, where okay. business transactions occur. So that keeps that lifeblood in the form of dollars okay. moving yes. through the system. But I also buy health care for about a quarter of a million people, okay. state employees, retirees, their dependents, some municipal lives. Mm. Um, I pay all the state employees. I pay the state's bills, or mm -hmm. at least the lion's share of them. Okay. And I run, uh, uh, I do a monthly letter uh, to the people of the state of Connecticut and to the governor that tells them where we are in our budget year versus what had been budgeted. Okay. And in that way, that role of fiscal guardian yes. really comes to the front. Yes. Because it requires that sometimes um, I disagree right. with a party or a leader or a governor of my own party or of the opposite party. Right. That's why you're the guardian. Right. And math that. is math. And we're yeah. independently elected. Right. And it's important for people to know where we are versus what was budgeted. So sometimes that means I'm reporting a deficit. Yes. And sometimes it means, so like now, I'm reporting a surplus. This sometimes this, yeah, because that's often, that's often a kitchen table comment, you know. Yes. People will say, I thought they just said last week that we're two, you know, two million dollars and whatever, and by next year we're going to be four million, and and then the next week you get a thing and say, well, we're ahead of budget and we're we're you know, right. tracking fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that explains it a little bit. Well, that that defines it because in the business acumen you have a tracking timeline, and you mm -hmm. say, at a, if we are at a point a quarter of a way through the year, and 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 we've spent half our money, we're uh oh. Better slow it down. That's right. Or you're halfway through the year and you've only spent a quarter yes. of your budget. Oh, this is going well. Yeah. All right. And you're on the timeline and all the things you have to get done. All right. So that explains it. That's that's an interesting point. Now, it, it also is managing the state's accounts payable, performing cost accounting, now, and reporting of the state government's activities and moni monitoring the compliance of other state agencies with accounting procedures. What, a little bit about that. You're watching what they're doing? Is That's that, right. Okay. So we set the accounting procedure for the state. The comptroller okay. does that by right of statute and the Constitution. And that requires that state agency heads, commissioners in most mm -hmm. uh, cases, have to comply with the guidance that we give them about okay. the way that they're going to account for resources in and resources out okay. in the simplest terms. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an important thing that we have one way of doing business mm -hmm. across the entire enterprise mm -hmm. because then you can report more easily. You yes. can compare across, you know, you get to yes. really do some of the analysis that's mm -hmm. necessary uh, to see are we doing things most efficiently and effectively as we could mm -hmm. uh, or not. Mm -hmm. And if not, then what can we do to do things better? Give us, a, give us an example of that measurement. In other words, if you were to see that some part was not running well and you say this needs to be run more efficiently, are you looking at number of employees doing the work? Are you doing the return on investment of where you've spent the whatever? Yeah. Give us an example. Well, I'll, I'll pull it back into my own okay. agency, sure. right? So uh, I always say you always start with yourself before okay. you start telling other people what yes. to do, right? Yes. So, right. So in our case, um, I buy about a billion and a half dollars in health care. Okay. And that's a lot of money. Is, is this from different health care Groups or one? So what we do is for state employees, retirees, municipal lives, right. we buy a plan and we use two third-party administrators, okay. we call them. So uh, in this case, this year, it happens to be Anthem and United okay. on their Oxford platform. Okay. 
and we buy a lot of health care. So that's fine, and we have limitations on like what the plan needs to look like okay. because it's collectively bargained between right. management and labor. Right. But that doesn't mean that you can't find efficiencies within that. Okay. You can't do things smarter in a way to bring savings to the state budget. Okay. So we moved a lot of our retirees years ago into a, a program that maximized Medicare for their prescription coverage. Okay. That saved the state $80 million wow. year over year. Wow. And we finally got the federal government mm -hmm. to be the first dollar payer for a population that they are responsible for. We're second oh, in that case. Oh, okay. We moved our retirees recently over to a Medicare Advantage plan, saving the state $130 million wow. a year, year over year, wow. uh, by just delivering care smarter See, this and is drawing down more federal dollars. So that people right. know more of where you're saving money because people get the feeling that the state is not being run well, but they're behind the scenes, things are being done. Well, go ahead. I yeah, no, uh, but those are just two examples. Yeah. So w w even though sometimes it feels very constraining, mm. like you're locked in on what service you have to provide, that doesn't mean you don't have a responsibility mm -hmm. and an opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to do it smarter and faster. Mm -hmm. And so uh, whether it's those issues around healthcare, or right now we're in a very active negotiation around our pharmacy benefit. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of money in the pharmacy space. Yes, a lot of people taking a piece of the action mm -hmm. and it's driving up prices incredibly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can the state do to help to control that cost and also make a difference in the lives not only of the people that I buy health care for, but for others who mm -hmm. are required, who mm -hmm. need a market mm -hmm. that's actually working a bit better than it is right now. Yeah. What would you consider, I, I guess maybe your department, or what would you say Connecticut's biggest challenge is right now in getting itself back on track economically? What, what do you see? Maybe it's from the perspective as being comptroller or just your own personal view on it. Yeah. I would say um, as both, as both yeah. a taxpayer in Connecticut yes. and someone who has a leadership role, yes. um, at least in part, in the way the state is run. Um, we you have, do have a dog in the hunt. I do. Mm -hmm. um, and the good news is I have a very privileged place to try mm -hmm. to make a positive difference. Mm -hmm. And I try to think about that every morning on my I'm drive sure to do. work. I'm sure you uh, do. So what can we do, for example, to get Connecticut's fixed costs under control, mm -hmm. right? What can we do to deliver services more efficiently and effectively? Mm -hmm. I don't think, as some have stated, that Connecticut is particularly top heavy with employees or that, you know, it's this big sort of slow moving organization mm -hmm. that uh, there are a lot of pockets of innovation around state government. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we can only do so much when you have budgets that are getting, you know, where services are getting crowded out by fixed costs. Right. So we've done a lot of work around, How as have we said. gotten into this fixed oh, cost gosh. thing? I mean, we, we know there are union contracts and so forth. What other things besides union contracts are yeah. considered fixed costs? Paying for the electricity? I mean, or what yeah, are we well, talking some, about? Yeah, well, some look. You've got personnel, which is always a fixed cost, depending on right. how many lives. You have to have. Yeah, you got to have people to make the machine run. Otherwise, right. you know, nothing right. happens. You do have pension liabilities that have been allowed to run up That's over true. the years, mm -hmm. and I would not actually attribute that to sort of the labor side as mm -hmm. much as it was. Governors in the past have cut really bad deals, or. Right cut decent deals, but then didn't keep their word by funding every year what needed right. to go into the accounts to make sure right. that we were. Right, the, the so lockboxes weren't there. They, they weren't, and, yes. and when they were there, they found ways around them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but you inherit a mess, mm. right? And then people don't want to hear after a while, mm. uh, it was that guy's fault. They want to know, what sure. are you doing to make it better? Mm. So wrangling those costs, making sure Connecticut um, really is the land of steady habits in the best sense mm -hmm. of that phrase, in mm -hmm. that uh, we set the rules of the road, for example, mm -hmm. for business or for nonprofits mm -hmm. or for municipalities, and we don't keep changing the rules every year. Yes. Let people know what the regulatory environment's gonna mm -hmm. look like so they can operate, try to bring some relief to them in the property tax area or in the healthcare area or mm -hmm. in places where government can use mm -hmm. you know, what it does well to make a difference. And then let business be business. Yes. And let government be government. Mm. And focus on what I always call broad based economic development theory. And that is not picking your company over someone else's company right. for, to give you $10,000 and everybody sure. feels like a hero, but rather to take those resources, more often than not, mm. and invest in infrastructure, mm -hmm. education back office support, mm -hmm. health care, the things that we know are really challenging mm -hmm. nonprofit budgets, small business mm -hmm. budgets, frankly big business budgets depending mm -hmm. on the issue. Um, because if we do that well, if we do what government does well 
and allow the private sector to do what they do well, mm. coupling all of that with Connecticut being named, you know, one of the, the number, f the fourth most innovative state in the country by Bloomberg. Really? Because of STEM education and oh, engineering yes. and a whole bunch of, you know, yeah. inputs that they use. Mm. The, the the state of our education system, which is generally superior to other parts of the country, oh, we have a generally. lot of great private universities, public universities, and even high schools. But yes. we have some challenges yes. too that we need to address. Um, our healthcare system, biotech, financial tech, all of the things that are reflections of the big brains that Connecticut mm -hmm. has, yes. um, make us just a candidate to be incredibly successful. I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I think that Connecticut can be, and I even feel that for my husband and I in our town, I feel that sometimes you're very close to being a great entity, mm -hmm. and you're that close for being off the cliff. Right. And, 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 and no middle of the road and, often. And, and no, <laughs> and no, and I think, I think the fact is, is that the national scene plays into it, of mm -hmm. course. The global sure. scene comes into it, of course. Mm -hmm. The fact is you've got to pay attention to your own knitting. Right. And, and we have, now sometimes you can say we have all of these people and their ex expertise, great minds, you know, great thinkers, think tanks, you mm -hmm. know, all of these wonderful words and rhetoric. Uh, but sometimes you can get too many cooks in the kitchen, too, and you need that leadership, mm -hmm. which I think everyone is looking to Governor Lamont to bring to that. In other words, to give everybody a play. He doesn't care whether you're a Democrat, he doesn't care whether you're a Republican, you're an independent, you're a, you vote, you're a registered voter, you don't vote. He wants everybody to come in and give the advice, and then he's responsible for sorting out That's right. how this should get done. That's really the governor, uh, governor's job, yes. um, is to try to bring us all to consensus. Do you think that's going to happen? Do you think um, he can do that? Um, you know, I don't he's know the answer to that. He's got a very personable way about it. You know, very different than the previous governor. Yes. Um, you know, and he and uh, Governor Malloy and I didn't always see eye to eye. Right. There's no secret uh, about that. And I congratulate you on being independent enough to make the comments. Well, I, I appreciate think, that. You know. Yeah. And, and it's you know it wasn't always uh, comfortable mm. or convenient. No, of course not. Uh, but but again, that's the responsibility of the job. And that's right. Someone once asked me, "What's the primary skill of someone mm -hmm. running for an office mm -hmm. like this?" And I often say, "Don't tell me what you're going to do. Show me what you have done in moments where you True. have." Uh, done the right thing at potentially great risk to yeah, your yes. career or to yes. your right. Yes, then you know that it's someone who's sort of got the spine to be able to do, to do that. Work. And that's why you've stayed in that spot, I think. Yeah, this yeah. is my ninth year, which right. really is head scratching. Is that, is that historic for a comptroller? No. So the longest comptroller is there's a tie. Okay. It's between <laughs> Nancy Wyman, my predecessor, okay. and Ed Caldwell, who was comptroller a couple of okay. comptrollers before that. Okay. Uh, I don't know that I'm going to actually challenge that number. You know, we'll, we'll We'll see. But I, you enjoy your position. I, I really do. As you, I think yeah. you know, I spent a couple of months a few years ago uh, with an exploratory committee for governor, thinking yeah. about what yes. I might, uh, yes. what I might bring to the table yes. in that conversation. Yes. And decided after five months, I really did not want to do that for a number of reasons, mostly you can because do more behind the scenes. I love the job that I'm yeah. doing right here. Yeah. I love the healthcare work, the pension mm. work. You know, using data to make big decisions, mm. and having a legislature and hopefully a governor partner yes. that are willing to sort of come along for the ride and work together. I will, I will, um, you know. I've had more substantive conversations with Ned Lamont in the last year or so oh, isn't that great? Uh, than I had that's with Damaloy in eight. Oh, uh, that's great. So, um, he's well, as a I said, he's a listener. I definitely very open guy. Uh -huh. I did interview him, you know, when he was running the gubernatorial race, right. and he seemed very, you know, open and hopeful. And I, 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 I like the fact, being a business person myself, I like the fact that he's a business yes, man. Absolutely. I think he looks at the bottom line, and if we're going to have to take a good dose of medicine to make it right, Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. Right. That's what we're going to do. Yeah. You know, and I think if I have to change my mind on, on something that I said before, then I guess that's what I have to do. And if that person doesn't like what <laughs> what we're going to do, that's too bad because right. we have to do it. So, which brings us to debt diet. Uh, where yeah. are we, and 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 how's that going? And so, this has been I, an edict you know. of the governor's office, right? Mm -hmm. The governor, as part of his early uh, announcements, said mm -hmm. that he was going to put Connecticut on a debt diet. Um, Connecticut borrowed, uh, has historically borrowed um, a lot of money for a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Borrowing is an important part of what public entities do and private entities do. Mm -hmm. You know, capital. Where does it come from, mm -hmm. and how do you? How do you achieve uh, uh, the numbers you need to do big infrastructure projects, yes. for example, and other things? But it's strayed over the years. Mm. So governors are completely in control, at least right now, mm. um, of what gets on the bond agenda and you know what gets mm. voted up or down. And often they have the votes to control whether it's going to be yes, yes. or no, more yes. often than not. 
Um, so I'm always in favor, when necessary, to borrow money for, again, infrastructure, school okay. construction, the things where the bond, the, the, the asset that you're, you're contracting right. for, outlives the life of the I bond. I understand what right? you're So yes. long after you pay it off, that school building mm -hmm. is still there, that mm -hmm. bridge is still there. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes bonding for ongoing expenses, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in difficult times, mm -hmm. has been a place that governors of like both parties costs. have gone to. Like right? fixed costs, yeah. Like fixed costs, ongoing, mm -hmm. right? Right. shifting things off the, yeah, the general fund budget. One credit card to pay off another credit card. Right. Mm -hmm. And some of that's out of necessity. I don't think mm -hmm. it's, you know, I ill intended. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to sort of keep the whole thing uh, mm -hmm. moving forward. Maybe so, it's not thinking enough out of the box. It certainly could be part of it, mm -hmm. sure. Mm. So I think the challenge for Governor Lamont will be, um, I, I yeah. as an individual taxpayer and yes. co controller, agree with the idea of limiting some of our mm -hmm. borrowing. But now the question is limiting to what? Mm. Right? Mm. What Who's going to be disappointed? Who about, decides? Yeah. And what are you going to do with the disappointment? Well, which brings us to uh, Senator Fon Fera, mm -hmm. who is challenging some of how do this bonding happens, and does the legislature want do they want to have more say in what happens and so forth and how things are covered? Right. Um, you know, I, I won't say it hasn't happened in the past. I, I can't recall anything in particular, but it is a Democrat challenging his. Democratic governor yeah, on how it's run. Yeah. I mean, how do you see that turning out? Uh, so on the politics, it happens mm. actually more than is often okay. reported, Maybe right? We so we're, okay. we're not a monolith, right? Right. Um, right. And as a, I'm a Democrat, yes. Um, but I, my beliefs about how we should administer services mm -hmm. in the state may be different than other Democrats, mm -hmm. and I think that's a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. I think I get uh, I get very nervous when I see a lockstep political sort of like everybody get Party in line, line vote, yeah. even when you know they disagree. Yes, right? yes. You see that play out in the federal stage right now where yes. you know folks disagree but yet they're yep. either afraid or unwilling say, yeah, to buck. Fear. Um, so you know Democrats you know you get two Democrats in a room you get three opinions right. Yeah. You know, we, have a, <laughs> we have a lot of thoughts about all of this stuff yeah. um, and I think that's actually healthy in yes. the decision-making process. So yes. I understand Senator Fonferra's concern. Yeah. Um, I don't think his idea will pass muster ultimately. Because the idea was to get a couple of Republicans and a couple of Democrats. It was really to ice the governor out, essentially, oh. of control over the oh. bond agenda, okay. uh, just to shorthand it, yeah. um, and would kick the constitutional officers that sit there now off it yeah, as because, well. Yeah, is, uh, that's been in the what shall we call it, the Constitution, I guess, of how it's run? Or? There are pieces in the Constitution okay. that influence this and statutory as well that okay. influence this. Right. So when, when it'll be challenged. Come to a I don't think it will ultimately. Okay. I think it uh, is likely to die a quiet death, the I idea. Yeah. Um, but it's, I think it's an important signal yes. to the Lamont administration that the legislature, and the, yeah. uh, Senator Humphrey is correct, yes. is the partner. Yes. They are not the second. They are equal branches of government. Right. They are the appropriators at the end of the day. Right. And a, a Which good is working relationship is, yeah. is critical. Because once it's set, then they get to where it's going. Right. right? Is that what we're saying by appropriation? Yeah. So okay. right now, the legislature actually has to authorize bonding before it even gets to the bonding uh -huh. you know, committee. Mm -hmm. So um, in that way, they already have a lot of control over, right. over what appears in the package. Mm. Um, they may want more, but they need to figure out how to work together. And there's a lot of new faces at the mm. Capitol. The governor has a brand new administration, and there's a whole bunch of new legislators as well. Sure. So uh, some of it's growing pains. Mm. Um, and. Uh, these conversations are all good. I don't yeah, no, I think they things. are healthy rather than, I, I mean, bring it out in the open and having the challenge and then you fix it and then you work together on th other things going forward. Sometimes it works out that way or not. Right. Um, well, our, our time has gone very fast today. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, <clears throat> I think it's a, just a wonderful opportunity to really find out a bit what goes on behind the curtains, if you will, because you know, most people get their news from the news, from right. the media. And we're, of course, being uh, a grassroots, um, Connecticut Valley Views being a grassroots show, you know, we are trying to get something that's a little bit more time to talk to you, get into things a little bit more depth. And, and hopefully what we have done is we have brought that, that picture, you know, closer to the people and the opportunity and, and to alleviate some of this apathy, because there's apathy out there, I can tell you. Yes. People are like, we can't do anything about anything and nobody listens to us and 
whoever we vote for, and they're going to do what they want to yeah. do. That's but why it, despots win. Right. And, <laughs> and people tend to dislike things they don't understand. And yes. if they don't understand how government works, they're going to tend to dislike it. Agree. Because all they see is, uh, you know, after, after the sausage is made, you know, they get the results of it. All right. Well, I have uh, one other question. I know it's important to you. This, uh, this is an act opening the state employee health insurance plan to small business employees. Tell us about what that's all about. Sure. It's House Bill 7267. And it takes all of that work that I talked talked about that we're doing in healthcare yes. and trying to make a difference to a part of our economy that is really struggling and that is small businesses. Yeah. Um, there's a market there for small businesses that has been in constant failure um, mm -hmm. over the last decade. There are 25% fewer people insured through their small employer today mm -hmm. than they were 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. People, there are fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer companies competing sure. and prices just going through the roof. Right, right. So if you poke a legislator or a governor even <laughs> yeah. for that matter and say, tell me something about small businesses, yes. they'll say they're the engine of our economy. Yes. And then if you ask them, so what are you doing about that? Yes. You know, they'll say, well, we're doing this economic yeah. development thing and that thing right. and sprinkling money over here. Right. Here's a way that we can bring small businesses into a full risk sharing relationship with the state where we're running a very efficient right. program and give them predictability and stability mm -hmm. and allow them to do what they're trying to do, and that is run a good small business, get the talent that they need to right. do that, retain that talent, because right now it's hard for them to find the people to do the work, and when they find them and they train them, they get recruited away to a bigger company that has a benefit package. Of and this will bring more revenue in. For here. Absolutely yeah. right, and, and it improves a situation uh, that is really untenable uh, mm -hmm. at this point. So um, 7267 is an important piece of legislation. It's edgy. Mm -hmm. It's got its opponents, as yeah. you might imagine. Yeah. Uh, but no important reform will go through opposition. So that's a study opposition. you're going to be doing. That is not. That oh. is bringing them in. We're ready to oh, go. Oh, you're ready to go. And it's got a number of other elements that we don't have time to talk about today. Yeah. But um, we run probably the most efficient health plan in the state of Connecticut public or private right now. Well, so we can make a difference. Phenomenal. Well, we certainly hope that that goes very well. Thank you. Okay. I do want to thank you, and I want to give a uh, website uh, to people to go to. And uh, the website for the Office of Comptroller is osc.ct.gov. And I want to remind all of our viewers to please see all of our programs at www.ctvalleyviews.com. veterans need your support. Foxfield Farm for a Recovery Mission is a not-for-profit organization that has been established to provide an equestrian groundwork training program for U.S. veterans with PTSD and related issues incurred through military service. This curriculum will be offered at absolutely no cost to any veteran participating in the program. This foundation will also incorporate the repurposing of rescue horses and locating new responsible owners. The synergy of the work invested by the veterans to aid the recovery of these horses is equitably therapeutic. Please go to our website to be a supporter, www.foxfieldrecoverymission.org. Thank you.